Welcome to INET Live. I'm Rob Johnson, the president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. And this episode of INET Live is on the future of work. I'm reminded of a time when a number of Swedish economists encountered uh, the New York consulate and brought me in. And they said, we love the robots. And they talked about how with the social contract that they had in Sweden, that one could count on dynamic transition, taking advantage of new possibilities, but all of their basic elements, your children's education, your family's health, and retraining and other things were part of a social responsibility. Today, Jed Kalko, Chief Economist of Indeed, Shivani Nair, a research specialist from UNDP, and Sid Suri, a principal researcher at Microsoft, will discuss, is this time different? Data, artificial intelligence, and robots. We'll examine the impact of modern digital technologies on the structure of society, the labor market, inequality, and systems of governance. At the end of our discussion, I'll moderate a Q&A from experts and from the audience. Please submit your questions anytime by clicking on the Q&A button and writing them in there. Let's get started. Shivani, please uh, help us get off to the races. Thank you, Rob. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this and having me on. Um, I'm going to base my initial remarks on our flagship human development report uh, from the UN, uh, the Human Development Report 2019, where uh, we talked about the interaction uh, between how technology is evolving uh, in current times and uh, inequality. So. As you know, there are many channels, um, you know, to, from technology to rising inequality through the labor market. But I want to highlight two other things today. One is who has access to modern technologies, including the um, broadband internet, uh, Wi-Fi, and um, you know. Why is this important? So as we know, there are um, huge differences between access to the latest technologies between um, rich countries and you know poor countries, what we call in our jargon, high human development and low human development countries. But also there are huge differences within countries and nowhere is this more true than in the US right now. So a lot of um, our children are doing online schooling, uh, you know, right from primary school to middle school, secondary school, uh, um, college education, everything is online, work is online, and it makes a huge difference. I mean, what can be more fundamental than being able to get an education and whether you get it or not depends on whether you have a good, reliable internet connection and a device. And we are seeing huge differences in access. And this is becoming, you know, in present times, um, the, the COVID crisis, this is one of the biggest issues facing humanity and prospects uh, for children, for the future. And then, so this is one way in which people are being left behind. And then, I would like to highlight one other way in which groups of people are being left behind. Um, you mentioned, um, you know, technologies like AI and uh, machine learning, and um, so who are the people who are developing uh, these technologies and who are being able to participate in this new economy? Is it broad-based or is it, you know, are there groups of people who are being left behind? For example, uh, a recent study by LinkedIn and the World Economic Forum found that only 22% of AI professionals worldwide are women. And uh, so clearly when you look at statistics like this about women and other minorities, you see that you know, these technologies maybe are being developed in certain groups, in certain regions. And um, we know there are implications when um, AI is, um, you know, when uh, AI is trained uh, on data that is not representative of entire populations. There are huge biases. There are implications for facial recognition technologies, for all kinds of applications that are being developed. And when the teams that are developing these technologies are not diverse, there is a real risk that there will be uh, biases that will be ingrained into these technologies and lead to greater inequalities through this channel. And um, I think I'm going to leave it there for now. And let's see what the others have to say. 
Thank you, Shivani. Sid, please share with us your, your thoughts and opening perspective. Thank you. Uh, so first off, uh, as Shivani said, I'd like to thank Inet and Rob for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in front of everybody today. Um, in my opening comments, I'd just like to make two points, uh, both of which come from uh, a book I recently published called Ghost Work. It was uh, co-written with an, an anthropologist, Mary Gray. Uh, she and I are both members of Microsoft Research. Uh, the first point I'd like to make is that humans power a lot of AI systems. And a lot of people don't realize that. They talk about, a lot of people talk about the widely available sources of data and the cheaply available computational power that fuel the rise of AI. But what they don't realize is that machine learning al algorithms learn by example. For example, say you want to write an algorithm th that detects if an image contains adult content or not. Well, what you need is training data. So a few hundred, probably a few thousand images, uh, some of which are labeled containing adult content and some of which are labeled not containing adult content. Well, where did those labels come from? Those labels came from human beings and they provide the training data and they come from crowdsourcing sites like Amazon's Mechanical Turk or every internet company has their own sort of internal platform where they do this kind of work. Um, and, and ghost work is the story of these people. And the second point I'd like to make is uh, taking that one step further, at any given moment, there's a set of problems machines can solve. Well, whenever there's a technical innovation, the set of problems that machines can solve grows. And the, so, like I said, there's a set of problems machines can solve, and outside that set are a set of problems that humans solve. Well, when there's an innovation, those humans get displaced by the machines. But then there's always a new frontier of problems that you need humans to solve. And that sort of ever-moving, ever-growing frontier we call the paradox of automation's last mile. And what I think the right question is to get away from this rhetoric of, are the robots going to come and take all our jobs? They're not going to come and take all our jobs in my lifetime, or I would even argue my son's lifetime. I think the better question is, these people that are being displaced by these technological innovations, what's happening to their jobs? Are they getting, as new jobs are created, are the people who are displaced getting those jobs? Are those new jobs as good as those old jobs? Are those new jobs as dignified as those old jobs? How are we gonna get to wherever we're gonna get? Let's make sure we're doing that in a fair and equitable way. And what is our responsibility to those people for whom those, their jobs are being displaced? I think those are the better questions to be asking. Thank you. Thank you, Sid. Jed, your thoughts? Great. Uh, let me add my thanks uh, for being invited to participate um, uh, in the panel as well. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, very briefly, um, three quick thoughts um, also to help start us out. Uh, the first is um, I think uh, there's still lots of uncertainty uh, about what automation means for the future of work. Um, and uh, there's been a wide range of research uh, findings that are really all over the map. Uh, in terms of how many jobs or tasks um, might be uh, threatened by automation. I think it's much clearer, though, um, what the distributional effects of automation might be. So even if we don't know um, how many jobs, if any, um, might be at risk, um, it's very clear which jobs are more likely to be at risk than others. There are clear demographic implications, um, uh, clear implications for inequity, given that uh, the jobs that are probably safest from automation tend to be those that require either the most or the least education, um, and some pretty clear geographic implications of the distributional effects. Um, and it's likely in the US, for instance, um, that automation uh, will provide some of the greatest benefits uh, to places that are already richer than others uh, and harm the types of places um, that are already struggling. So that's the first point about the importance of distributional effects. Uh, I think the second um, is that we typically focus on uh, what automation might do to jobs uh, in the sense of thinking about how automation will affect labor demand. Um, will uh, employers or organizations uh, replace or supplement workers um, with different technological innovations? Um, but automation also affects labor supply. Um, historically, uh, automation of lots of household tasks um, made uh, it possible
possible was one of the factors that made it possible uh, for the dramatic increase uh, in women's labor force participation. Um, in the future, um, automations in transportation technology um, might also uh, change uh, the nature of some caregiving responsibilities um, and possibly expand labor supply. Uh, so again, we need to think about automation not only as it affects labor demand, um, but also labor supply. Um, and finally, um, the extent and effect of automation on the labor market um, is certainly not just about what's technologically possible, um, but what's feasible economically. Um, what uh, kinds of automation um, make economic sense um, to do? Um, and that ultimately depends uh, on what happens with wages, uh, what happens with lots of other factors that affect labor supply and demand. Uh, for instance, the aging population uh, that uh, is likely to reduce uh, labor supply longer term um, may end up pushing up wages and being a greater incentive to automate. Um, but again, that depends uh, not only on what's technologically possible, uh, but what's economically feasible. And ultimately, uh, the effects and the path uh, of automation uh, probably depend as much on the economic and social context um, as they do uh, on what's technologically possible. Thank you, Jed. Well, uh, let's uh, move to discussion where uh, I would in encourage each of you to ask each other questions, but let me start. Shivani, you talked about the access to online infrastructure, machines, internet connections, the quality of internet connection and the like. Should we be envisioning those elements as public goods something that should be provided by the state rather than leaving it to private companies to provide where essentially dense urban areas that are affluent will attract business and potentially increasing returns. Rural areas would be in essence left off the grid. Is this something, uh, like I said, that should be state infrastructure or is this something that the private sector can handle uh, and provide for the population? Great question. Um, I mean, in principle, definitely there are huge externalities uh, from providing this infrastructure, from making sure children are educated, um, you know, all families, uh, all kinds of families can have access to internet, they can go to work. But the reality is that um, government finances are stretched like never before as we know uh, tax revenues are falling um, you know governments at our levels are struggling uh, states uh, local um, you know support from the fe u.s federal government has been very limited um, so uh, at some there is a gap and yes private companies do have to uh, step in in fact there's a lot of discussion about big tech and the evils of big tech and you know how they have been concentrating economic power and rise of monopoly but uh, what we also have to highlight is the responsibility of these companies uh, i know some of the other members on this panel work for some of these companies but there's there's been a growing um, movement to um, you know ask the big big tech companies to step up and there is a uh, there is some experience so for example facebook has been providing uh, low cost internet very rudimentary uh, internet in like over 60 countries it's called it's called facebook connectivity and uh, other um, big companies amazon apple alphabet have also been uh, made, you know uh, taking this this kind of initiative within the us in uh, traditionally less connected geographical areas so uh, definitely this is the time for them to step up and you know also uh, earn some good karma you know Sid on the same kind of frontier of public private responsibility you talked about jobs won't go away but the nature of the job yeah. or the work or actually the nature of the training required mm -hmm. to meet the new challenges may uh, benefit from a public boost. 
to the what you might call education curriculum or sector that helps facilitate that. Do you see that as public policy, or do you think that's also something that the private sector can uh, rise to the challenge of? Uh, both, uh, quite frankly. Uh, so uh, a couple of things. First, uh, just to follow up on a little bit of uh, Shivani's answer, um, you know, uh, Lawrence Lessig, a few years ago, he gave a very compelling talk, and he compared the U.S.'s uh, decision to privatize uh, broadband to various other countries' um, uh, desire to, to keep it as a public good. And his conclusion was the experiment, as he called it, of privatizing in the U.S., quote unquote, in his words, failed. Uh, we, we have higher cost bandwidth uh, and much lower reach than the countries that uh, provided it as a public good. Um, I'm sympathetic to what Shivani said that that budgets are stretched, uh, for sure. No question about that. Um, I'm not an economist. I'm a computer scientist. But I'd also wonder, like, you know, does do those costs get recouped by, you know, more startups, better educated population, that kind of thing? I'm not sure. I'm not an economist. I can't make those those arguments. Um, now, coming back to Rob's actual question about about skills. Um, 100%. So I, I agree. I think it's both. Uh, here's what Microsoft, for example, just announced an initiative with uh, LinkedIn to, I don't skill up, like upskill like 25 million workers uh, due to the COVID, um, due, in, inspired by COVID, is to turn sort of uh, an opportunity, a, a, a tragedy into an opportunity to upskill workers so that they can sort of provide for their families. So that that is 100%. Uh, something that's top of mind for Microsoft, and we're we're constantly asking ourselves, our our president Brad Smith, he's constantly asking, what is the social responsibility we have for the innovations we make, and that's something that, quite frankly, uh, I went to grad school in the early 2000s. Nobody was talking about back then, but you hear it every day now. And I'm not saying all the problems are gonna, are are, are the outlook is rosy and all the problems are being solved, but the fact that that rhetoric has penetrated into the sort of see a computer science sort of genre, the, the, the computer science industry, I think is a positive thing. Jed Sid uh, said he wasn't an economist. Maybe you can pick up some of the uh, energy for there and, and augment uh, his thinking. Well, I'm gonna, I'm going to first try to think of where I can weave in that I'm not a computer scientist. Uh, <laughs> so I can uh, return the favor. <laughs> Uh, on that. That's um, right. I think there are um, two uh, important kinds of roles, certainly for the public sector, um, uh, on the investment side, uh, in terms of basic infrastructure, um, uh, as well as uh, funding basic science and research, um, on which all of these technologies were ultimately based. Um, but also, um, there are um, policies that um, would make it much easier uh, for the labor market to manage um, technological changes like automation and other technological changes um, that uh, expand opportunities um, for people who, uh, you know, may you know be uh, displaced, you know, either by automation um, or by other forces. Um, uh, housing, and, and often these are far afield um, from uh, technology policy. Um, Housing, for instance, um, we're in a situation right now in the U.S. and some other countries around the world um, where a lot of the job opportunities are in places that don't build enough housing, um, and therefore the opportunities are inaccessible uh, to people who can't afford to move to uh, the Bay Area, New York, to the London, and so on. Um, there are other restrictions uh, that uh, require uh, licensing. Um, for occupations that, again, make it difficult for people uh, to enter a new occupation or even to move with their current job. Um, you know, these, uh, again, far afield from technology policy, um, but can make a difference uh, in terms of how well uh, the labor market adapts uh, to inevitable changes like technological change. Okay. All right. You can... Shivana, you have a question for either of your uh, co-panelists? Oh, yeah, I just wanted to jump in, um, you know, maybe add to some of this. Um, so I completely agree with Jed that 
the policies uh, and the policy arenas go way beyond technology policy like it's a it's a whole society response whole society approach uh, again jed you mentioned earlier uh, female labor supply and uh, historically how uh, you know certain kinds of technology enabled more women to join the labor force but a lot of those questions are becoming relevant again so you know covid 19 is a game changer and um, it actually eases some of the pressures that you just mentioned for example you don't need to live uh, maybe in new york or san francisco that much you know it may not be that important um, on the other hand it, it is uh, you know heightening some uh, problems so again coming back to uh, female labor supply um, given the, given how uh, you know families are home now children are home um, and the increased burden of caregiving responsibilities and the traditional nature in which these are shared among men and women I mean, even though it's changing but you know given the traditional uh, imbalance between the genders uh, there are now reports of how a lot of women are leaving the workforce uh, because it's just not possible for them to you know keep everything going and um, so so again technology this is all uh, related to technology because how uh, you know on the one hand how can technologies be developed in a way that some of these uh, pressures can be eased um, you know maybe giving uh, even more flexibility to families with children or with caregiving responsibility for older adults to maybe let them rem- uh, continue to work remotely even though even when office is open people go back to offices and then again broadband access technology how can technology uh, make it possible for uh, you know different demographics to participate in the labor force so f- definitely technology has a role and also you know it goes both ways like how technology is developing also has an impact on the lives of people so even before covid um uh there there were there were uh, there is research on how uh, you know women carry a double burden and how they have you know they work as much as men but then they also have more caregiving responsibilities and uh, how how what is the work culture in technology is there a culture of you know always being on always being available because that usually implies that if you have a family with caregiving responsibilities and somebody has to be always be on at work then that usually means that somebody has to be off and very often that is the woman and very often women were dropping out of the labor force because of that so you know technology is not something separate from society how technology is developing how tech companies are operating is very much interwoven with society Sid, anything uh, yeah. you want to um, explore? Yeah, so I just want to follow up on a lot of points that Shivani just made. Um, we've been doing here at Microsoft a lot of studies, both internal to Microsoft and external, about the effects of working from home, of remote work, on families, on employees, on information workers. And just to echo what Shivani said, study after study, quantitative, qualitative, however you want to do it, women with caregiving responsibilities are getting hammered. Uh, the stress of trying to keep up at work, trying to um, educate their children at home, all of that, you know, and, and, and run the household just proportionally falls onto them. Their stress levels are through the roof. They're exercising less, they're eating less, they're less productive, they're less happy, they're less engaged. Um, I, am, I am desperately afraid that you know women were making 80 cents on the dollar compared to men and i'm afraid we're going to regress i'm afraid that the their male counterparts are going to get promoted faster because they're more productive during this time and that 80 cents is going to turn into 75 or 70 and we're going to go backwards uh it's 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 something that we are looking at and we are frankly worried about um that that's one you know key component that Shivani mentioned that I j- I just wanted to highlight it, the struggle there is real. Um, and I think the I mean one of the things that a lot of economists are watching very closely is how much of these differences how these differences play out uh, in households with kids uh, as opposed to households that don't have kids um, and uh, I mean this goes directly to. 
um, policies around um, reopening schools in person um, as opposed to distance learning. Um, I mean, we're, we're people point out um, often that uh, this period of the pandemic, um, you know, in some ways is accelerating uh, trends that may have already been underway. Um, at the same time, I think you know we're living in the midst of um, uh, an extraordinary shift, um, much of which is temporary. Um, we won't. Uh, those of us who are working from home, um, not all of us will continue working from home to the extent that we are during this period. Though some will, um, but when we think about you know the effect of uh, technology and automation uh, on the labor market and the future of work, um, we are I mean we are sort of living in the middle of you know, one of the most dramatic and sudden case studies um, on how technology changes work. Um, and even though we're living in the middle of it, we already see um, how complicated it is, ways in which that remote work um, exacerbate inequalities and other ways in which it may narrow um, uh, differences, you know, ways in which it creates new opportunities uh, for people who didn't have them, while at the same time uh, reinforcing other inequities. Um, and so it's, you know, extraordinary to be sort of living in this case study um, for the longer term questions that we're looking at. So um, I hope you're right. I'm afraid you're wrong about the temporary part. Um, I, I really do hope you're right. And, I'm, and it really keeps me up at night that I, I, I'm afraid you're wrong. Um, you know, the, the, I, I've talked to various doctors, they estimate six to nine months before a vaccine, another, you know, six to nine months for it to be distributed. That's, we're talking about 2022 before any kind of return to normal. That's already, you know, uh, two years, roughly speaking. I mean, that's a long temporary, A. And B, you know, a lot of tech companies, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Google, et cetera, have been um, adopting permanent work from home policies. Um, on top of that, the ones that haven't adopted the permanent work from home policies are thinking about uh, permanent hybrid policies. So I'm not, I'm not so sure that the right framing here is when we go back to the way it was. I'm not, I don't think there's going to be the way it was. There's going to be something, there's going to be some kind of new equilibrium. And I'm a little scared of what that means for, for, for women, quite frankly, and, uh, and, and underrepresented minorities. Uh, and I don't think anyone's expecting a going back to the way it was. Um, I think okay. what's likely is sort of longer term, um, and I agree that longer term, you know, easily means, you know, two years or more out, um, will be, you know, something both different than pre-pandemic, but different than what we're in the middle of now. Um, and even, yeah. you know, even, even people or um, businesses that work from home permanently, um, that experience is very different if you are also trying to homeschool your children yeah. Um, than if, um, you know, children can be back at school. So, Agreed. you know, there are plenty of ways in which, you know, we can't extrapolate from what we're in the middle of right now to what the world will look like uh, two or more years out. While at the same time, I do think there will be some structural changes, um, including a long-term increase um, relative to pre-pandemic times in people working from home. So um, I, I think the focus should be on how things will change. So, so it's true that a lot of people um, are working online now because of COVID. But even before that, you know, there was a rise in remote work. Uh, we have digital labor platforms. We have work and different tasks within work being outsourced, uh, you know, to people who are working from home, who are um, online. But then there were um, there were all these concerns about the quality of these jobs, which were very, which are very valid. And I think those are the questions that we should be examining as we go into this new normal. So the ILO has a, a lot of work on uh, digital labor platforms like Amazon, Mechanical Turk, and others. And uh, they found that um, a lot of workers, significant proportion of workers in different countries are making below minimum wage. So um, 
so there there are real concerns about you know the 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 kind of work that is being done online the the extent of exploitation and uh, we all know about uh, the issues of you know who is an employee and who is a contractor and what companies are getting away with when you are not an employee or just a contractor it's not di- just digital labor platforms we also have the ride sharing platforms so in it's speaking of trends that are getting accelerated uh, maybe some of this is getting accelerated M- more and more you know we we are going to probably not be employees we are maybe going to move towards being contractors more and more so then what are the uh, safeguards that need to be put in place what are the policies what is the role of government policy in terms of social protection the quality of our work uh, you know saving us from exploitation and um, you know we don't want to see a rise of a casual informal workforce uh we don't want to go backwards in that sense so uh so th- there is a real opportunity to imagine what society uh, what the world of work is going to be and how it needs to be shaped let me uh, yeah, um, interject oh I'm, okay go, go ahead, ahead. So i was i was going to just going to say a little bit about a specific sector which is i'm experiencing and other parents on this panel have shared with me in the preparatory meetings that pressure that congestion from working at home you've talked in your presentations about the need how do i say that jobs won't be eliminated but the need to train to stay in the dynamic flow and evolve aren't child care professionals becoming more important now when my children are at home it's not someone that's just doing the laundry it's someone who's helping them learn how to use an ipad discussing their science class maybe teaching them music between classes in other words is an increasing proportion of the education of young children going to fall either on parents or create a different type of child care professional in my home I have to brag about Claudine Louisant who's a violinist, a musician and a tremendous tremendous asset to my wife and I. My wife is the chief executive of Planned Parenthood. She's got an enormous task. There are uh there's no way without her help or someone of her caliber that we could make it through this challenge without our children suffering greatly. I I sense that the child care requirements are going to be a lot different than what people hired for 5 8 years ago in the coming decades but uh, yeah i i completely agree with you i i and i am in the same situation i i rely on a very high caliber professionals uh, to care for my two children um but a few things first of all um there has been a child care crisis in this country specifically a lot of people don't make enough to hire uh, you know high quality yes. child care and uh, uh, or so there has been a child care crisis and a lot of it was being um, it was it was disguised and a lot of it was disguised by this overstretching of parents um, women and also men completely overstretched parents of young children who were just kind of making it work uh, you know keeping all the balls in the air but uh, one of the things that the pandemic and the crisis have done has that it has laid bare this reality because you know you can't hide the children in anymore they are on your zoom calls it's very obvious that those responsibilities are there and uh, it you know hopefully it leads to one a recognition of the value of this work that a lot of the work that was invisible before it should not be invisible it should be valued it should be recognized and you know enough resources should be um, provided to take care of children and also the elderly a lot of people have responsibility to take responsibilities to take care of the elderly and so first of all recognition and secondly um, you know systematic response to um, the child care crisis and um, not just hoping that you know it will go away or think people will just make it work it's it's people are really suffering yeah and i think shivani's 
I, I think great point, especially at the end, is that the child care crisis pre-existed the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, and like the, the ways in which the need for child care has changed during the pandemic, um, I think that's something that probably is temporary um, in that uh, kids, you know, hopefully soon um, will be able to go back to uh, school in person, spend time with other kids and so on. Um, and so in thinking about our needs for child care, um, that's an area where we should um, be thinking at least as much as the structural problems that already existed before the pandemic, um, rather than thinking about um, that sort of solving the problems of child care during the pandemic, because those are likely to look very different than uh, the sort of longer term challenges two or more years out. Do you feel that uh, the nature and structure of education will revert to the classroom uh, to the degree it was before, or are we likely to have a a more significant dimension from online education, even in the longer term? It's it's hard to say. Um, I mean, one of the... uh, issues that we've been raising here at UNDP and UN is that, you know, maybe this is not an isolated crisis. Uh, I mean, maybe even if you look at zoonotic diseases, uh, there's going to be more instances, uh, you know, the pressures that we are placing on the planet, uh, how we are interacting with wildlife. uh, There are all kinds of new diseases, new crises that we cannot even imagine that that may be coming. Of course, there is the big one, climate change and everything else that all the tipping points uh, that are going to be triggered. So uh, my point is that um, it's hard to say. And I mean, I see the infrastructure that schools are developing. Uh, Some schools here, uh, I'm in New York City, have been very agile. Um, You know, they have put in place some really great infrastructure and they they are preparing to, you know, teach online. Maybe, uh, maybe having to switch back and forth. Um, there's a lot of training that is going on, and um, I think they are being realistic. You really, you know, like Siddharth was saying, you really don't know how long this crisis is going to last. And even if we have some back, some kind of return to the normal, we really don't know what we are facing. And in fact, uh, maybe later we can spend some time talking about the role of technology in dealing with um, the climate climate crisis because that is way bigger than anything we are seeing right now. Okay. Um, I I think just just one one more thought on this. Lots of people, I mean, surveys and anecdotally um, seem to have been pleasantly surprised at how well uh, remote work has gone. Um, My sense is that very few people have been pleasantly surprised um, at how well distance learning is going. Um, And I think, you know, even though there there are certainly ways in which remote work um, uh, can, like, can increase and bring lots of flexibility um, for people, um, for the most part, distance learning um, has reduced flexibility for people, especially if um, they aren't able to work or work as much. Um, because of the increased child care and uh, uh, child education monitoring responsibilities. So I think, you know, uh, it's qu- remote work and distance learning really are qualitatively different, um, you know, in thinking about, like, which, which one offer parts that we really want to continue once the pandemic's over um, and where we'll want to um, get back to pre-pandemic norms as quickly as possible. So I don't have much to say about the uh, distance learning bit, but the remote work bit, um, there's one danger that I'm I'm seeing a lot of companies, uh, there's a little bit of a trap a lot of companies are falling into, and they're using short-term data to inform long-term policies. So for example, they, they stare at their dashboards and they say, okay, you know, our developers are checking in just as much code, fixing things about it, publishing just as much. And, you know, this seems to be working, so we're going to go with it. What they don't see is the longer-term effects. So 
For example, collaboration remotely is much more difficult. Brainstorming remotely is much more difficult. Maintaining social capital, weak ties, those links, those having those those uh, spontaneous conversations that that might spark an idea. That's much more hard to do remote. All of those effects are long-term effects. So I'm a little scared about innovation in tech companies who are adopting these long-term policies without having studied these long-term effects. So the uh, other question is, uh, this morning, I spent the morning reading Pope Francis' new encyclical, which was encouraging us to re-examine the goals and the roles of society and governance and uh, adopt a less economic or materialist perspective on what you might call the scorecard. Uh, I've heard several conversations recently, including today, where people talked about precisely at the time, whether it be climate change or health systems or some of the challenges you brought up, we need more governance it's exactly at the time when we've exhausted our fiscal capacity, as Giovanni mentioned it earlier on. Uh, do we think that our fiscal capacity is exhausted? I mean, is this not more like war preparation for a major transition in a society that's been struggling? And, and, the, and the question at some level is, what is the discipline associated with an austerity at a time when, which you might call you're early in the phase transition, that people find very frightening. And I think this is part of what Pope Francis was getting at, was that people are very despondent and frightened because they consider government to be the instrument of the powerful that's part of what's oppressing them, not a system to reassure them about opportunity and security and safety in the medium term. How do you see this tension between what we're identifying as the challenges, we can go to climate change if you'd like, and what we're seeing not happening on the part of governance? So uh, just to clarify, uh, there is no fiscal constraint for the federal government. Uh, countries like the U.S. that can borrow in their own currency, there is no fiscal constraint. In fact, this is the time to invest in huge infrastructure projects. Borrowing costs are near zero. And um, it's a myth that um, you know the, the, the deficit is a problem. It's not at the federal level. Where there is a fiscal constraint is for states, for cities. And because of the unique political climate, that the U.S. is in, so you know, so New York City is declared a, a rogue, uh, whatever. New York State is declared a rogue state by the federal government. So all that drama. So basically, the support that is needed by states and cities to implement the right policies, um, not austerity, but in fact countercyclic policies, expansionary policies, uh, stimulus is uh, missing from the federal government. Now, um, this happens, this happened even, this happened in Europe, a lot of my misguided austerity uh, following the 2008-2009 financial crisis, uh, completely unnecessary suffering and pain inflicted on populations. But uh, so, so this happens uh, quite frequently. Um, there is a need to address uh, climate change, the climate crisis. Um, we are currently working on our current Human Development Report uh, 2020, which is uh, on the climate crisis, uh, but beyond that, looking at biodiversity loss and other imbalances uh, in the that you know human beings are inflicting on the planet. And uh, yes, uh, you know, this is, uh, there is a huge role for government. Um, of course, profit driven uh, companies, you know, they look at their bottom line, they look at uh, shareholder value. And um, it is, it is uh, very broadly and at a very, uh, you know, le at the level of principles, there is a role for government uh, to shape policy, to step in, to set priorities, a uh, huge role for science and technology uh, in shaping, uh, you know, how humankind does actually going forward. 
I actually have a question for Shivani. Do you feel, given COVID, the remote work, and maybe the shift away, maybe COVID causes a shift away from living in cities, do you think that would make a dent on climate change? Or is the problem way too severe for, for that to have an impact? So, uh, great question. So, uh, there have been studies that have already come out, and there has been a small dip in carbon uh, dioxide emissions, mm -hmm. about uh, kind of uh, equivalent to... Um, Actually, uh, yeah, I'm, I might have to look those studies up again, but it is a small dent, relatively small dent. And the reason is that uh, the, the big bulk of CO2 emissions comes from our heating systems, our energy systems. So there is a small dip from, you know, not flying that much and there's a, you know, trans, trans, uh, there's less commuting happening, transportation. But, but think about it, we are all in the developed world, that's where most of the carbon emissions come from, in the US, in Europe. We are all still running our air conditioners and now we are switching to heating. We have our, you know, hot water, we have our, so that is the main source of, uh, you know, carbon dioxide emissions. There's also industry, but uh, so there has been a dip from curbing of some activities, but it's uh, a lot of people are worried that it's temporary, you know, rightly. And, um, and also it's not so big. And, you know, obviously people are emphasizing how this is an opportunity to, uh, first of all, cement some of these trends of whatever dip there has been to try to, uh, you know, make them more systematic. So, for example, a switch to remote work is also a good thing in terms of reducing commutes, reducing emissions from transportation. A lot of our meetings, I used to fly do a lot of meetings in Singapore, in you know Europe, and everything is on Zoom now. So there is a big case to uh, you know make these make make sure these things continue to be online because uh, the carbon emissions from. Uh, I think you're on mute. I think you went on mute, Shivan. How's that now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so I was just saying that. So, so one, there it makes sense to try to make some of these temporary things like online meetings and you know reducing um, airline travel to make some of these permanent. And also, you know, just the fact that we were hit by this huge shock, COVID nineteen, that nobody saw coming, and the huge implication of this. Maybe this is the time to step back and you know, take stock of all the other crises that might be around the corner. And, you know, climate crisis is a is a really important one and try to put in place energy systems, renewable energy, um, you know, how, how can we address this crisis and, you know, how to move forward. Um, I hope I answered your question, Sid. Very much so, thank you. You're on mute, Rob turn to some of the questions that have come up from members of our audience. We have one question. They said that uh, we had been talking about COVID-driven remote working for top-tier educated digital workers seems to be working out right. But they asked, uh, can we speak specifically about what you see as the future of work for the lower tiers, what Jed referred to as the least educated and sometimes digital workers? How do we see that profile or that possibility in the context of the changes we see going on? Uh, I spent a little time thinking about this. Um, I spent a little time um, crunching BLS data, for example, and the hardest hit sector, so COVID hit in March, the hardest hit in, in, in April, uh, the U.S. lost 20 million jobs. Um, the biggest chunk of that came from uh, it was seven million. It came from the hospitality and um, leisure industry, which is disproportionately Hispanic. Uh, the next biggest chunk uh, came from the healthcare industry, which was dis disproportionately African American. Um, people of color, lower educated people, are having a disproportionate impact of COVID. Working from home is going to honestly kind of cleave society in two. The extremely high educated people carry on working from home with their information work jobs. Those working uh, jobs that can't be done from home are going to face some serious challenges. 
you know, both in the health realm and, yeah. and the economic there's system. A, there's, a, there's a working paper out of Chicago. Uh, the first author's last name is Dingle. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, talk, they talk about, you know, which job, about roughly speaking, according to their work, everyone who can work from home is. It's about a third of, somewhere between a third and 40% of the U.S. population. Side note, same fraction holds in Canada. Um, and, and like I said, those are largely information work jobs. And those who can't be done are, uh, I, I'm, I'm fearful. I think me, both the um, acute phase right now, as well as the chronic damage that we're seeing, um, both are likely to exacerbate inequality. Uh, as Sid mentioned, sure. huge differences in terms of who can work from home. Uh, something like 50-something percent of those with a college degree or more are working yeah. from home. It's about 10 percent of those with a high school degree or less. Um, but even beyond this acute phase, um, what, even once... Um, there's uh, uh, a vaccine and, you know, things are back to whatever normal might look like. Um, we are not going back to three and a half percent unemployment right away. Um, so the chronic damage also exacerbates inequality because higher unemployment uh, tends to increase gaps, um, gender, race, ethnicity and education. So both the acute phase and the chronic phase um, are likely to widen um, all of these gaps. Okay. And it was that damning statistic from Pew, you know, 40% of the U.S. population can't, can't withstand a four or $500 shock to their income. Um, and COVID is, for many people, the impact is way worse than that. So I'm, I'm fair. We have another question from a member of our attendance today. Uh, new technologies in some respects enable workers to work flexibly and some become freelancers. They work on multiple platforms, but perhaps because of that, they don't share a strong relationship with any one employer. And as a result, may be excluded from something like the social security system or employer sponsored healthcare. How would we change the nature the structure of, of public services in our society to protect freelancers without and essentially not reduce their well, their well being? I've spent a lot of time studying this, um, both on, on the micro task into the spectrum, Mechanical Turk, and the macro task spectrum, sites like Upwork, where freelancers can be hired for big projects like software development and things like that. Um, the question is uh, spot on. So, so first of all, um, a lot of people think that if you're a freelancer, you don't have loyalty to one company. Um, that's actually not, that's a little oversimplification. Um, in any of these platforms, there's more workers than work to be done. So the freelancers really want to get rehired. If they make a relationship with one company, they want to double down on that and, and get rehired. And because you know, spinning up with a new company, new ways of work, new lingo, new, um, new, new technological systems, that all takes time. And you can amortize those costs if you work for the same person over and over again. So freelancers are actually very loyal to the same company. Um, that's one point. Second point. Uh, we need benefits that are mobile, that the freelancer can take with them. For example, if I hire a freelancer, well, why can't I contribute to their 401k? And then if Jed hires that same freelancer, why can't he can't why why can't he contribute to their 401k? Why can't the 401, why why can't that benefit go with the freelancer to wherever they work? For example, um, that would be more of like a government kind of change. Um, another kind of change that I've been working on is, by and large, people who hire freelancers in the tech sector. They want to do the right thing. I've done a lot of interviews with, with people uh, inside and outside of Microsoft. They want to pay a fair wage. What's a fair wage for a developer who lives in Bulgaria? I have no clue. I've been studying this for years. I have no idea what that is. Does he get socialized medicine? Does he get socialized retirement? Again, I have no idea. I want to do the right thing. And I have no tools at hand to do the right thing. And that's a problem. I'm trying to get platforms aware of this problem and get them to step in because they have the data and the know-how to, to expose these problems and show them to the people doing the hiring so they can ensure that the freelancer they're hiring is getting a fair deal. Um, that's one way to make a change. Another way to make a change is, 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 is the government. And the third way would be to, to, to mobilize the workers, help the mo- workers mobilize themselves. And, and, and make sure that they're getting a fair deal, whether that's by unions or whatever choice that the, the workers want to make. 
I think progress has to be made on all three fronts. This is a really hard problem. Yeah. We've got a question. Oh, Shamali. Sorry, hmm. just quickly, I wanted to just add that a lot of it is about uh, data. Uh, so, so these platforms have a lot of access to data, but the regulators and the governments, so in the say the Bulgarian government or the US government, uh, they, they don't have access to the same kind of data. It's becoming very hard for regulators to keep up with these new platforms and the kind of work uh, that is being done. Um, just to put in a plug for a U, uh, sister UN organization, the ILO has been doing some really cool work. If maybe you guys want to look at it, they have a number of reports that have come out on digital work on um, these platforms Forms. And this is precisely what they're trying to do. They're trying to get data and then standardize things across countries, across the world to do some kind of comparison. And and one of the results is that a lot, in a lot of countries, people are making less than the minimum wage in that country. So that's something that I wanted to just flag. And people are working on this. Okay. We have a question from Jay Pocklington, who leads our Young Scholars Initiative, and who will be uh, continuing the seminar uh, after we're, we complete this hour. He says, how can technological advancements be used to achieve a more coherent society and help our democratic process? Any, anybody want to wade into the water here? I way, mean, way, out, yeah, way outside my expertise. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's actually te technological companies are actually getting a lot of flag for undermining the democratic processes um, in a lot of countries, and um, you know they are under scrutiny. Uh, by lawmakers, um, by the public for this. Um, they are uh, making, um, I think some of them are trying to uh, put in place the right safeguards. And, you know, we all hear about problems with uh, social media sites and basically disinformation. Anybody is able to put out any kind of fake news. Um, it's like if you had access to the New York Times, but you were not fact-checked, so you could publish any article on the New York Times and a lot of people read it. So that's hard to imagine, right? So, But th this is what you can do with Facebook and Twitter and, and you know, um, WhatsApp. So basically, th these are problems. And, you know, this is where regulation has to step in. As I've said a few times, it's hard for regulators to keep up with how fast technology is evolving. Um, if there can be some creative ways to ensure how uh, technology can strengthen democracy instead of undermining it, that would be great. I mean, initially there was a lot of uh, excitement about how technology enables people from you know distant lands to get online and connect with each other. I remember during the Arab Spring, there was a lot of excitement about how social media platforms brought people together. They were able to express their discontent. They were able to mobilize against autocratic governments. So this was about a decade ago, but then over the last decade, things kind of became uglier, and the 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 bad effects of technology started to, you know, uh, come forward. So it's a balance. It's it's a choice. It's up to societies, you know, which way we go. I agree about what Shivani was saying about the the dangers, the, you know, the issues with dis disinformation on social media sites. That's that's a huge problem. Uh, one promising place to counterbalance might be voting. Um, if uh, there's a lot of research in, in 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 computer science about how to vote securely and distributedly remotely, and if if that could be a way for computer science to sort of give back and um, enhance democracy, um, that would be promising. You're on mute, Rob. You're on mute, Rob. It's good I have technologically sophisticated people to help me. <laughs> thanks. Um, thank you, Sid. Uh, I just wanted to thank our panelists, Shabani, Sid, Jed. It's been a fascinating discussion, and I want to 
remind our audience that uh, they'll continue the discussion, go for a deeper dive, and you uh, can join the INET's Young Scholars Initiative for that open forum discussion. If you want to join it, please click on the Young Scholars Initiative link on the bottom of the screen to join, to join them. And to foreshadow next Tuesday at noontime, we'll have another seminar, Bad Timing, Offshoring Meets Automation, that will be moderated by David Sirota, who is the Communications Director for the uh, uh, Bernie Sanders campaign, Brad DeLong, Rana Faruhar, and Damon Silvers. Uh, if you haven't already registered, you can find the link to the right or on the INET website. And please follow INET Live at, at INET Economics to hear about new episodes and forthcoming information. But thank you all. This has been a delightful experience, and uh, I hope we can meet in some future context once again. Between now and then, I'm going to read ghost work again, and uh, I'll probably write to each of you with my own, uh, my own personal questions, which I had to hold at bay today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much.